Okay, Alex, uh, you gave us some, I guess, words of caution around uh, some tightness in the market. And, you know, having worked in the auto industry, I remember several examples when commodities got tight. And as I mentioned in my introductory remarks, the, the engineers, everybody responds. So there's a dynamic that sets the stage for alleviation of that tightness. My question to you is, do you see that potential for um, a way out of the tightness that, you know, there's some indication from some of the players in the market that will address that? Because, you know, there's a there's actually a market opportunity for them. And then secondly, you know, how are the financial markets going to build out to allow for hedging and other tools that will potentially alleviate some of the tightness? So we establish a secondary market in financial tools, hedging in particular, that would uh, be beneficial. Yeah, no, that's, that's interesting. Um, the second question, I suppose, the... Um, if we think about financial instruments, the, the challenge with some of these markets is that there's not the liquidity or the size in them, for the most part, that enables these sorts of tools to be to be used. There isn't really one agreed on lithium price. There's a lot of different providers um, uh, of prices, and whether you're talking about spot or contract, you've got different benchmark products so of different qualities. So it becomes very challenging to base uh, financial instruments that are around a market that doesn't have great liquidity or transparency. And it's, I think it's pretty similar for cobalt as well. There is an LME cobalt price, but my understanding is that, that that is viewed by the market as being indicative of where the real price is at, but not actually accurate in terms of uh, today's price. But let me, let me just push you a little bit on that, because <laughs> as, as the market grows, there's a, uh, an in, increase in the incentive for price discovery. Hmm. Uh, in, there's an incentive for uh, a financial uh, market to facilitate. So, in, you know, if the volume gets bigger, uh, then, you know, you see the market start to say, yeah, we, you know, we really can't rely on the opaqueness of private placements of this cobalt supplier selling to this cobalt buyer, and none of you in the audience know what that transaction's price is. There are a lot of private firms that do anonymized surveys, and you know you can pay them fifty to one hundred thousand dollars, and you might be able to get some data. But how you know where do you see that breakthrough? Because we saw this happen in other markets mm. for natural resources. Do you see that evolution, you know, especially if you get EV volume uh, moving up more substantially? Well, the, the clearest example of that evolution that I'm familiar with is in the iron ore sector, where um, it used to be the case before the global financial crisis that contracts were agreed at a price between the big three producers and the, the major offtakers once per year, and then the price stayed constant for the whole year. And then when Chinese demand went through the roof for, for iron ore for their steel industry, um, their a burgeoning spot industry established and the spot price became completely divorced from the contract price um, such that the miners were not making the, the full value on the, the material that they were selling. And then when the financial crisis hit, they had since rearranged their contract prices much higher and then all the Chinese off-takers had to renege on those contracts because suddenly the spot price was a third of the contract price that they were tied into for a whole year. Um, and that was then there was sort of a supplier-led um, BHP were at the forefront of it, but Vale and uh, Rio Tinto signed on pretty quickly uh, to, to move to firstly ag agreeing prices on a more quarterly basis, and then also to have those based on a, a price discovery service, an index-linked price. And yeah, pretty, you know, not long after that, we did start getting people being able to invest in, um, in swaps and futures based on the, mm -hmm. the Shanghai, uh, sorry, the Singapore, the SGX uh, iron ore price. Um, the extent to which that could happen in lithium, I think there isn't the incentive on the suppliers yet to reduce the to reduce the opacity 
in the pricing. Mm -hmm. There doesn't seem to be, there doesn't seem to be the incentive in the way that BHP certainly pursued it and got the other big three on board when it comes to iron ore. At the same time, the liquidity is a challenge. The iron ore market is, is far larger, um, although it's, still, it's got a lot of similarities in terms of the highly concentrated supply side. Um, but I would say that moving to that sort of environment where there's uh, financial instruments that are allow you to hedge your, your price risk, in lithium in particular, is five years plus. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. I'm going to ask one more question. Please, uh, I invite anyone who'd like to ask a question up to the two microphones that we have set up. Evan, you talked, I think, really interesting comments that you made around recycling. And if you look at right now the chemistry of choice is the 622, um, you know, what percent of that cobalt in a recycling, you know, kind of production process, what percent could actually be recovered effectively and economically? Well, I think within current literature, um, so I think effectively within just technical processes, you can see recoveries anywhere from 50 to upwards of 80%. Um, but actually, economically, I think that there's still some challenges. Uh, predominantly, if we're looking at sort of the options two and three on my slide, so not necessarily producing the mixed alloys or the mats, but looking to produce some of the chemicals or active materials, um, looking to build out those processes require certain feedstocks, uh, feedstock volumes, and we're still waiting to have those volumes come to market. Uh, it just doesn't uh, justify the capex to build those yet. So very, very much similar to the uh, the mining environment, um, looking at some of those high pressure acid leaching units. So um, we just got to see how that would come, come to life, but certainly uh, we can recover a, certain, a significant amount of the cobalt and, that's and metals. Yeah. That, that, that's helpful, thank you. Okay, may I invite questions? Okay, I'm Jeremy Mihalik, Carnegie Mellon. I, I have two quick comments and a question. My quick comments for uh, Elsa had mentioned, uh, as we get to economies of scale, materials will matter more. And we've done some analysis of battery manufacturing processes. And we think that we've been at economies of scale way before the Gigafactory. This might be useful to you. Uh, second is uh, Evan mentioned about um, innovation being primarily uh, incremental, quiet, not you know big headline grabbing kind of things. And we did an expert elicitation last year, and that was pretty much the consensus around all the experts that we talked to as well. Uh, that might be interesting. The question um, is that Ellen was talking about how when there's scarcity, it drives innovation. Mm -hmm. And so my question is that the talks have been focused on cobalt, nickel, but NCA and NMC are not the only lithium ion chemistries. So if those prices go up enough, what would stop battery designers from switching to lithium iron phosphate or lithium manganese oxide or something that doesn't involve those? materials. Yeah. So I'd say in, in one word, it would be China that would stop that, um, primarily because a lot of the EV incentives are around energy density. And the recent shift and really a lot of the demand for nickel and cobalt um, has been uh, moving away from LFP to uh, N NMC chemistries. So I think that it's, again, we're still in a very um, subsidy sensitive environment. Uh, so, and with the bulk of, of EV demand coming from China, I think that um, we're going we're gonna to continue to see that, that happen. But, um, but yeah, it's very much policy driven and it's, it's on particular metrics around energy density. Can I, can I just yeah. add though to that? Because I, great question. And, you know, one of the um, observations, I guess, that we would make, given we have two battery labs at the Energy Institute, we have a lithium ion battery lab as well as a solid state battery lab. And, you know, the, the tech is evolving uh, there. And, you know, there is an increasing likelihood that we will see this innovation yield some really cost effective, you know, results over time. So I, I do think, you know, while we've got the subsidy tailwind driven cell production in China, what we need here is we need more of a culture of investing in this innovation that's happening. And where 
the gap potentially is in our uh, culture here is the dollars, the investment dollars. And that's why I mentioned the opaqueness of the data, because I think price discovery and innovation and, and CapEx works best when you know, you're, you've got headlights on what the data look like. So the data transparency could hopefully enable some of that investment in these alternative chemistries, because they're there. It's just we need a VC, and I don't know if it's, you know, what kind of investment asset allocation, but there's got to be more dollars flowing in uh, to that here. Thank you. Question. Cynthia Lin Lo uh, from Cornell University. So as a natural resource economist, I really enjoyed hearing from the panelists about um, energy, uh, these energy metals and um, material science and mining and from uh, that uh, perspective. So thank you. I have two questions. My first question is thinking about another non-renewable resource that we have uh, used for uh, energy, oil and gas. Uh, Oil and gas, for conventional sources of these fossil fuels, even at the beginning of the 2000s, we are very concerned that we'd run out of oil and gas, um, for, and we we're relying so heavily on that for transportation. But then there's the advent of these, the shale revolution with the unconventional sources of fossil fuel, shale gas, shale oil, that sort of mitigated this concern. So my first question was whether or not you anticipate for these energy metals that there might be something analogous. So we're thinking just in terms of what supplies and resources we have of these scarce uh, metals at this point, but is there a possibility that there's this sh uh, shale revolution, I don't know, hydraulic fracturing type uh, uh, thing out there that um, maybe there's actually other sources of the similar metals? My second question is, if we want, if we are really concerned about trans sustainable transportation energy, it seems to me that ultimately we don't want to rely on uh, resources that are non-renewable as uh, components of uh, sources of energy for our transportation um, or sources of materials for our transportation energy. Now, I was wondering if the panelists could comment on the prospects of um, developing materials or sources of energy that don't involve any components that are non-renewable. Thank you. Maybe on that, on that first point, at least, from, a, from sort of a technological development perspective, I think there's been a situation, so for example, when people were talking about the nickel market split into, there was a situation, you know, going back at the, 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 when Chinese stainless demand started taking off, and they started, people were like, well, where's all this nickel going to come from? And then the, the, the solution, which was using a really old technology, it wasn't using any new or exciting technology, really, was produ production of this low-grade iron nickel alloy called nickel pig iron. Um, that then came on to be, you know, that's 25, 30% of the overall nickel market. So I think since then, when people have seen sort of some long-term, this is going to tear the market in two, people have said, well, the, I don't know how, but China will fix it. Um, so that, so there's, there's, certainly, there's certainly a possibility, and it can be really hard to predict, especially when there's a technological development involved there. And I think it does tie into the, the hydro processes for nickel, at least, that I was talking about before. People have been, for the last five years, very scared of investing in that kind of a project. But now we see a bunch of new projects that are just on the horizon under the starting, start of developments where people are more <laughs> confident about getting that technology to work and to be able to do it at a lower cost. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I think on your first question about if, are there any uh, scenarios or uh, examples of sort of this uh, of something analogous to the shale revolution, well, I think if you look at the lithium market um, over the last five to seven years, if we went back five to seven years, um, we would see a majority of the market uh, being dominated by brine resources, so the big brine evaporation ponds, um, and then really in the last two to three to four years, we've seen a lot more production coming from those rock or mineral resources in West Australia. And just a, a, a quick note on, uh, on Alex's slide of those projects that are coming online, uh, six out of nine of them are, are rock projects. So I think that really you've seen uh, newer, resor newer resources coming online um, that, might, that might have um, higher cash cost basis. And then even down further in the future, if lithium um, continues on this on price escalation, or it, we see some type of rebound. Um, people have even looked at extracting lithium from seawater, or geothermal brines. Um, so, yeah, that's that, exciting. <laughs> a tiny little button on that, I suppose, is that there is a technology that people are talking about because at the moment, the most of these brines you have to leave the material to solar evaporate, and it takes essentially a year, year and a half to that for the, to get the throughput. 
um, there are technologies out there that people are working on that would shorten that period to 24, 48 hours, right. wow. which would be extremely dramatic for the, for the market. I know we're running over. Is everybody game? We got one, one more question, and then we'll adjourn for lunch. Thank you. Thank you. Zheng Hongling, Oak Ridge National Lab. I have a question about um, battery density, cost, and what you, one of you mentioned about the easiness to recycle, right? So between density and recycle easiness, between cost and recycle easiness, what is the relationship? Are they like a trade-off in conflict or are they totally separate? Thank you. Yeah, I, I, can, I can talk about it. So in addressing the, the previous question about would there be a move back to LFP or LMO, I, I think that I answered the question um, not really clarifying that LMO and LFP have our, our previous generation technologies um, and that you know, the current policy environment in China is really moving towards higher energy density cathodes, so really the nickel rich cathodes. In terms of recycling, um, just to, that we've seen the interest in, the, in these uh, energy metal markets, um, you know, the price of the constituents in, in a nickel-based cathode, so an NMC or an NCA, uh, those metal constituents are much higher than LFP. Um, and so uh, we, there is some LFP recycling I think I've seen in China, but, but largely um, the, the jury is still out on, on the economics behind it. And really, um, on just a fundamental level, even if we um, you go that first route with, with smelting the batteries, just being able to recover those nickel, that nickel and that cobalt that provide the higher energy density um, just makes more sense. And so it's sort of, it's not necessarily linked towards energy density, but at the same time, you know, it just kind of works out that way with the, with the metals that we use. Great. Thank you for that question. And thank you very much. We are going to adjourn for a great lunch. I think... I'd like to ask all of you to thank the panel now for this session. Thank you.